Van McMahon, Van McMahon, baddest dude in all the land. Texas blood as thick as mud, he's Van McMahon. Van McMahon, Van McMahon, he's Van McMahon. Well, 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 well. It's always great to catch up with our guy, Tim McMahon. He joins us every Tuesday for the NBA Daily Assist. But is Tim trending in Salt Lake yet? He should be if he's not yet. Uh, Tim has a piece up today. We've been talking about it throughout the course of the show about the latest. I guess it's the latest chapter, the latest iteration in this story of um, what's gone on between Donovan Mitchell and Rudy Go and Rudy Gobert. Excuse me. Tim, my man, how's your day? Good, man. How about you? Doing well. So let's get right into this. Um, I want to start with the origin story. How did this how, how did this come about? Was it one conversation? Was it a series of uh, conversations? And what ultimately led you to writing what you wrote today? You know, obviously, the Jazz are a team that I've been around a lot. And I've always been fascinated by the dynamic between uh, Rudy Gobert and Donovan Mitchell. And you know, I, I, I've had an understanding for a while that it's it's it was it's kind of in a lot of ways a typical NBA star tandem relationship where you know there's going to be some friction, there's going to be some tension. You know, those guys they have very different personalities. You know, they they were never going to be best friends. And I've always thought it was, a, and their backgrounds are just so different. So I always thought it's a really interesting dynamic. And then obviously when they became in a lot of ways, focal points of a pandemic, at least from a sports and NBA perspective, and and the, the tension really turned into something that, uh, for for a long time, was was a lot more threatening and and more serious. I knew, look, I've got to really report the full story with all the background, and that took a while to get done. And you know, and and obviously Donovan Mitchell's uh, desire not to really delve into specifics and not to speak about it. Uh, was a challenge. You know, he did not want to speak to me uh, one-on-one. Obviously, I, I tried hard to make that happen through various channels, primarily through his agent. It's something that they did not decide to do, which, you know, obviously that is their right. Um, so had to wait for the uh, Zoom call with for, with reporters that he did last week for, final, for kind of that final piece uh, of reporting and then put the finishing touches on it. All right, let's start at the beginning. Uh, Tim, because there there was a time where I can tell you personally, I felt like these two, it wasn't just they were playing well together. I feel like they actually did like each other. What's your understanding as to when this relationship started to disintegrate? Well, and again, I think even saying disintegrate is strong. Okay, fair enough. Then whatever um, adjective you want to use. Yeah. So, and really, I think it's laid out pretty pretty clearly in the story that the primary irritant in their relationship has been Rudy's tendency to be very demanding, you know, you know, to to, to complain a lot, um, and it's really related to Rudy feeling like, hey, I should be getting the ball a lot more often, and it's not about Rudy thinking, you know what, I'm Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, get me the ball on the block and let me, you know, launch sky hooks. He doesn't think he's a Kim Olajuwon, but he thinks. Look, I'm screening. I'm rolling hard to the rim. There are a lot more opportunities for him to get lobbed, and it's not just look. He, he and Rudy is very honest. He can be very annoying. He gets on, you know, a lot of guys on that team's nerves with that. But it's mostly Donovan, simply for the reason that Donovan has the ball in his hands most often, and Donovan is still very early in his development as a as a primary decision maker offensively. He's he's as a rookie in the NBA. Donovan had the ball in his hands more often than he did as a, you know, his final season at, at Louisville. And, you know, you forget Donovan was a primarily a baseball player until he was 16. You know, even his freshman year at Louisville, he wasn't a full-time starter. He was a, he was kind of a role player there. And so, you know, it, it's kind of a case of this unexpected go-to guy who was thrown into a much, much bigger role than anybody anticipated. And, uh, and, and then, you know, Rudy, as he's coming into his own, you know, really feeling like he should be getting the ball more often. And then a big part of it is Rudy does really care deeply, I would argue too deeply, about status, about recognition, and because of that, about stats specifically scoring. Because, you know, look, 
you know how he reacted being snubbed for the All-Star, not once but twice, when clearly he was one of the top 12 players in the Western Conference. And he kind of came to a harsh realization that for him to get credit, not even just from casual fans, but, I mean, surprisingly from NBA coaches, that scoring was always going to be the most important statistic. And I, and I, I do think that's been part of this whole thing. So I'm going to continue to use the adjective because I have people I talk to, Tim. Uh, I have people I talk to as well, Tim. So uh, forgive me if if you don't agree with the adjective. You can insert yours there. But Mm -hmm. how much of the damage of this relationship is exacerbated by the fact that they have been quarantined for the past few months and haven't been able to play together? Well, and and that's their feeling is even after the positive test. And obviously, look, it's an unprecedented situation in the NBA because there hasn't been a pandemic, <laughs> you know. So the fact they were not only both positive for coronavirus, but the first two, and that Donovan blamed Rudy for infecting him. Which, look, I do think it's important to say that cannot be proven. 100%. It could have gone the other way around. It, you know, they could have gotten it completely separately. Of each other. So, but Donovan blames Rudy, whether he's right or not, which will never be known. And, and so, you know, they don't, they're not in the locker room a couple of days later. You know, it wasn't a situation where Quinn Snyder and the coaching staff and the guys in the locker room could really manage the situation. And then, look, let's just be straight up here. I'm going to say, you know, the, the two out of 10 on the NBA drama scale, which is what one source described to me as pre pandemic. Uh, I'm going to put that mostly at Rudy's feet, primarily at Rudy's feet. Taking it from two out of ten to wherever it was, Donovan got mad. He let it be known that he was upset, and he never accepted an olive branch publicly. And so I'm going to say Donovan's responsible for this. He made no efforts to to kind of mitigate, the, to use your word, the damage. And you know, I asked Donovan about that on the Zoom call. Why did you let this linger really for three and a half months? Why? I mean, it, it would have taken a tweet. You didn't have to even do an interview, a tweet, an Instagram post. Hey, big fella, can't wait to get back out on the floor with you. You know, whatever. You know, insert cliche, basically, look, we're going to be fine. We're going to move forward. He made no attempt to do that. And you can say it's not his responsibility. You know, his point was he didn't want to go back and forth on Twitter with people who were reporting whatever. There, there was no need to go back and forth. Literally one tweet, you know, accepting an olive branch that was extended by Rudy would have done a lot to quiet the noise. No, I thought the um, I thought the tone and tenor of Donovan's answer to your question just made the problem worse. I mean, I, I know he's young, but you can't fool people that have been doing this for 15, 20 years. And as I was hearing him talk, I was going, "Who's who's got who's got his ear? Who can help him out right now?" Because he's such a dynamic kid in so many ways, Tim. Yeah. But I agree with you. I, I mean, he has egg on his face, and a lot of fans here. And look, Donovan walks on water here. I want to be very clear, but a lot of fans here have been pretty unimpressed with the way he's elected to handle this. What lessons do you think he needs to learn the most from this? We all make mistakes, but you you hope you learn yeah. lessons from mistakes. So what do you hope he learns? Right. And, and, you know, in fairness to Donovan, I think sometimes we forget he is 23 years right. old. Yep. You know, because he is so polished. You know, he is a very charismatic, intelligent guy. You know, he is the product of prestigious New England prep schools, and there's some, you know, some, some suave and some, some polish that comes along with that. He is such a, you know, just a perfect pitch man um, and just so good, you know, with, with, the, uh, with the fan base, with the public, that, you know, you forget that there's a 23-year-old guy there and there's going to be some immaturity. And I think the lessons really that, that he can learn and where I think Rudy actually came across, in my opinion, very well is just in, in accountability. Rudy was as bluntly accountable in, you know, in, in the interview that I did with him as I think you could possibly imagine in this situation. I mean, he, you know, he acknowledges, look, I've been very demanding. He even called himself a, a word that we had to you know, put a couple dash dashes in there to, to censor a little bit. And you know, he said, I've been so demanding because Donovan was so good so fast. My standards are so high for this team that – he acknowledged there were times that he did it in ways that, that weren't productive. And I, I really got the sense, you know, with that, you know, with talking about Donovan being more of the face of the franchise, Rudy kind of accepting and understanding that and saying, hey, if I was a kid, I'd rather watch Donovan Mitchell play. He's a more exciting, charismatic player. I understand that. I understand how the league works. 
I, I, I got the sense that Rudy had really spent a lot of time looking in the mirror, you know, thinking about his role in, in this situation, reflecting and thinking of how, what he could do to make things better. Maybe Donovan has done that, but it's, it, he has not publicly uh, given that indication. Catching up with our buddy Tim McMahon, NBA Daily Assist 2.0 time. Uh, joins us every week. Tim has a piece up today on ESPN.com that we've been talking about all day. It's kind of the talk of the town right now. Tim, one of the things that um, you were able to learn is that a month into this quarantine, Rudy and Donovan actually did have some communication. What can you tell us about that conversation? Yeah, and, and, and Rudy let that out of the bag when he did his IG Live uh, thing where Taylor Rooks popped on. And it was actually the day before that that they talked. You know, what I, what I was able to learn is, is that basically came, you know, that the, the Jazz want to start doing the Zoom meetings, you know, the, the, the team Zoom calls, the Zoom workouts, you know, really just kind of team bonding exercises. And Rudy basically said, look, until I have a man-to-man discussion with Donovan, I'm not going to get on these calls and act like everything's hunky-dory. Like, we need to talk this out. We need to talk through it. You know, and, and again, it's not just Donovan being angry with him with coronavirus, but they both understand. Donovan said the, you know, the pre-existing tension had nothing to do with his reaction. You know, I mean, I, 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 I took that with a grain of salt. But, you know, they had a lot of things that they had to talk through, and basically they didn't have to come to any kind of, hey, let's go, you know, have sleepover parties or, you know, any, any of that sort of, uh, of deal. But they at least had to kind of get on the same page talk through their issues and, and, you know, hear from each other. Hey, this is about winning. This is, we've won before. It's been a very productive partnership. I mean, let's, that's one thing, like basketball wise, they complement each other extremely well and, you know, have potential to obviously get better, but they had to, I think Rudy definitely had to hear from Donovan that it was a, it was a business partnership that uh, they wanted to move forward with. And, you know, Again, I, it's hard for me, I think, to, uh, to, to, to kind of tell you what Don was thinking simply because I, I did not have the opportunity to have an in-depth conversation with him. So as you point out, Tim, both these guys are in line for extensions, but they're not the same extensions. Rudy is yeah. far more expensive than yeah. Donovan, and he's five years, five years older. So um, to me, the math there is pretty simple. But my question for you, while the question itself is simple, the response probably isn't. Do you think these two will stay here and continue to play together? Will the Jazz keep both? That is the plan. That is absolutely the plan. Nobody that I have spoken to, at least, and I, I feel like I've done my homework, nobody that I have spoken to believes that this rift is any kind of a reason that they can't continue as a duo, that, that, that they can't continue as a business basketball partnership. Um, Rudy's contract negotiations, I could envision a situation where, you know, perhaps that leads to plans changing. Just, and again, this, this, let me just make this real clear. This part of me speaking is speculation. This is not based on reporting. This is based on covering the NBA, understanding kind of the, the economics of the NBA, especially for a small market franchise like the Jazz. Um, and, I, you know, Rudy wants to stay in Utah. I, I asked him that. He was very, very clear about that. He's been consistent with that. I don't have a sense for exactly what Rudy is expecting or, you know, will demand financially. I, I, I cannot imagine that the Jazz really can, can reasonably cough up a Supermax extension. So I could see that situation getting tricky, but ultimately I think – I know the Jazz want Rudy Gobert to continue his career in Utah. I know Rudy wants to continue his career in Utah. I think with those factors that they will find a number where, you know, he's going to be filthy rich regardless. They will find a number south, probably significantly south of the Supermax. Um, and, and, and they'll move forward from there. You know, the Donovan extension, like you said, that's pretty simple. You know, it's, People kind of refer to that as, as the quote-unquote fun max because it's not nearly as, as big, you know, coming off a rookie contract. I'm sure they'll try to give him a five-year max deal and keep him locked up uh, as long as possible. And, look, there is some speculation that this is kind of uh, Donovan and his camp planting seeds to try to get 
eventually get out of Utah. Um, the people I've talked to pushed back pretty hard against that. That speculation is out there around the league. Having said all that, they have zero leverage. The, you know, the Jazz, obviously, with him being a restricted free agent, not this summer, but if it gets to that point next summer, they have all the leverage. And obviously, they have zero intention of uh, letting Donovan Mitchell play anywhere in the NBA but uh, in Utah. Give me your perspective, Tim, on the way organizationally the Jazz have handled this because I think it's been awful. And for an organization that usually handles things really well, this has been a big-time miss. And it really it took uh, a combination of like myself, uh, Andy Larson, guys like us, trying to put a little pressure on the organization to actually force out a conversation. And finally they did allow Dennis to speak, but it, it took longer than it needed to. They lost control of the narrative. What are your thoughts? Yeah, they they have definitely erred on the side of caution, and I, and I do think they erred, and, and I get it. It's a really tricky situation. It, Donovan obviously was very sensitive about it. Uh, you know, Rudy, I think by nature, is a sensitive guy, and I don't mean that as any sort of an insult. I think he's a very, uh, you know, he, he, he's a smart guy who, you know, is, uh, like I said, he does care about, about what people think of him, perhaps too much. Um they let Rudy twist in the wind. Now, the challenge for them was how do they firmly get Rudy's back without alienating Donovan? And that was it was a tough situation that you know I don't know exactly how they should have handled it, but there's no question they did let Rudy twist in the wind. And 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 it, it wasn't just a normal NBA situation; it was a deal where. You know, Rudy was being, and again, how much do you listen to trolls on Twitter and Instagram or whatever, but he was being blamed by people for, you know, the, the stoppage of sports throughout the nation and for, by some doofuses, for even bringing coronavirus to America. This stuff that's just so factually inaccurate, but it was, you know, uh, you know a, a, a lot of shame in that situation. He was in a tough spot, um, and, you know, I, I think that, uh, and again, this isn't coming from him. This is, is back to me reading between lines and speculating a little, a little bit. But I, I do think he absolutely would have appreciated more public support from the organization. Last team, last excuse me, last thing, Tim. Then we'll set you loose on this. Um, how do you expect it to affect the Jazz immediately in the interim? So the micro as opposed to the macro. When they start playing, look, yeah. they're on a plane right now. I mean, they probably landed, but. How will this uh, affect the Jazz right now in your estimation? There's definitely going to be some awkwardness. I think that's inevitable. Now, having said that, you know, they've had a ton of conversation between those guys, those guys at the front office, even at the ownership level, with their teammates, with the coaching staff. And the one thing that the Jazz really have in their favor is they have excellent veteran leadership. Joe Ingles is a great locker room guy. You know, he's the, he's the one who kind of, you know, really pushed these guys like, hey, he told them, it would be selfish for you guys to hold grudges against each other. It would hurt the rest of the team. You guys need to, to get together and figure it out. And I think that helped lead to the initial conversation. Mike Conley is a great locker room guy. You know, Ed Davis has immense respect in that locker room. Uh, I know he's fallen out of the rotation, but I think he has more respect after falling out of the rotation just because he's been such a consistent pro. There are strong voices in that locker room. That helps. Um you know, there will also be a, a magnifying glass on on this duo. No question about it. I mean, body language is going to be, you know, probably read even too much into. So they have to understand that and they have to deal with that. Now, I would say the thing that's going to impact the Jazz much more than any awkwardness of this relationship as far as this eight-game seeding schedule and in the playoffs is, well, they lost a 20-point-per-game score. <laughs> I, I think that's going to be much more impactful immediately. And then – uh you know, long term, we've got to see how it plays out. But like I said, the plan is to continue moving forward around these guys, not expecting them to be best friends, but expecting them to be uh, professionals and competitors and to be on the same page in, in terms of those areas. Tim, you're the man. Great work on this. It's really uh, carried the day around here. A lot of people talking about it for better or for worse, but great work. Be safe. We'll chat next week, okay? All right. Appreciate you, brother.